The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You are about to hear a conversation between a man and a woman who are having a discussion about enrolling in a university course. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Registrar's office, this is Pam. Yes, hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number? Yes, this is Mitchford University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first year and transferring students and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you? No, not really. I'll tell you what, why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Your address there, Richard? Unit 12, 15 Sportsman Avenue. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-M-A-N, Mermaid Beach. Four double five four. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. Uh, oh four one four. Hang on a minute. I don't call myself usually. Uh, I think it's oh four one four six five eight three three nine. Yes, that's it. Okay. Now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. Dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay, that looks fine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best, uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure, there are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building 
and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello. I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember, the most important rule of driving. Safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. OK, I have my seatbelt on. Now what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. 
But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly? Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. OK, a y park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Here an interview conducted by an interviewer special with the scientist Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Professor p i t as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa. in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote, there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high-security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high-security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. 
We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa. When we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope, the World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. My only thought was, oh shit! We immediately disinfected everything, and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We were finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age, but I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related, unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name but the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880 this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.